Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. I'm Kate Sears Patowski, Director of Programming for Expo Chicago. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Director Summit keynote on the occasion of Expo Chicago's 10th anniversary edition. Thank you. <laughs> we are very proud of the return of the Director Summit, a program that invites a diverse group of emerging art museum leaders from across the United States for a three-day program addressing the shifting dynamics of museum leadership today. Shaped in partnership with museum consultant Jill Snyder, a seasoned museum director, the Director Summit is centered on two public roundtable discussions on our public dialogue stage at Expo Chicago. Today is the second and final conversation, which we encourage you to join at 2 p.m. I'm going to introduce you to this year's cohort. Can you stand when I say your name? Nora Burnett Abrams from the MCA Denver. <laughs> Anne Elgood from ICA Los Angeles. Courtney J. Martin from the Yale Center for British Art. <laughs> Veronica Roberts from Candor Art Center at Stanford University. <laughs> Claudio Rodriguez from the Bronx Museum. <laughs> Virginia Shearer from the Sarasota Art Museum and Ringling College Art and Design and Daisy DeRosier from Gunn Gallery at Kenyon College. And of course, my dear colleague, Jill Snyder. I want to give a very, very special thank you to our partners at Sotheby's and Risk Strategies, as well as the University Club of Chicago for being such gracious hosts. I'm loving this cheer fest, thank you. <laughs> Next, Michelle Hargrave, Executive Director and CEO at Figgy Art Museum, will introduce our keynote, Paul Provost, and give a peek into Figgy's collaboration with Art Bridges. Please welcome Michelle to the stage. Thank you, Kate, and good morning. It's truly an honor to have the opportunity to introduce Paul Provost today, particularly given all the incredible work that he and his team are doing and the impact that they're having on museums and communities across the country. Paul is the founding CEO of Art Bridges, an innovative arts foundation launched by philanthropist and arts patron Alice Walton. With over 1.5 billion in assets, ArtBridge's mission is to expand access to American art around the nation and partner with museums of all sizes to create and support programs that educate, inspire, and deepen engagement with local audiences. Paul has led ArtBridge's since 2019 and has designed industry-changing uh, programs, including initiatives around DEAI. Working closely with the Board of Directors, he has structured the Foundation's strategic, financial, programmatic, and operational framework to create cost savings and increase impact and outcomes. And Art Bridges couldn't ask for a better CEO. Uh, Paul started his career as a curator at the New York Historical Society. He received a BA from Middlebury College and an MFA from Williams College and the Clark Art Institute, where he graduated first in his class and was named Robert Sterling Clark Fellow. He went on to earn his doctorate from Princeton University. He also completed executive programs in management and leadership, marketing and finance, and negotiating skills at Columbia Business School and the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And Art Bridges has grown exponentially under Paul's leadership, going from two to 30 employees in just a few years. And the work that they do is just, it's phenomenal and transformative. And at the Figgy Art Museum, where I serve as executive director and CEO, 
We've had the joy of partnering with Art Bridges in several different ways. A year ago, we presented an exhibition, Border Contos, Sonic Borders, which explored the complex issues around the U.S.-Mexico border through the photographs of Richard Misrak and the sound sculptures of Guillermo Galindo. Art Bridges not only provided a great exhibition that enabled us to present artwork not represented in our collection and to engage our community around issues, topical issues for them, it also provided financial support, which as a museum director is always uh, music to my ears, uh, particularly um, from, for those of us from museums with smaller budgets. With each partnership, Art Bridges also generously provides learning and engagement grants, which are intended to help the hosting institution design programs to reach new audiences, to engage current audiences in new ways, or emphasize interdisciplinary elements. For Border Contos, we receive funding for each artist to engage with different segments of our community. Guillermo, for example, did a public performance. He worked with middle school students from our Creative Arts Academy, and he also did a workshop with the at-risk high school students who we provide immersive outreach to. And since many of these students are first-generation immigrants, they were able to recognize themselves and their families in the Border Contos exhibition. Uh, we feel that creating a sense of belonging and self-worth and fostering creativity are crucial steps to helping these kids live a better life. Through the funding, we were also able to create interactive engagement uh, opportunities to initiate conversations and build bridges. For example, our interactive story wall encouraged visitors to share messages of hope and kindness that, they, that our visitors wrote on bricks that they assembled and turned into a wall. And our guests at our free family day dismantled the wall and took those bricks home with them at the end of the exhibition. We also provided space for visitors to share their personal immigration stories and worked with student, students from Black Hawk College's uh, multicultural and inclusion office on an audio tour in a small installation. Overall, Border Contos exposed our visitors to in incredible art, created new partnerships, uh, strengthened uh, partnerships with, existing, with our existing partners, and um, initiated important conversations within our community. ArtBridges also offers long-term loans from their collection and other institutions. Uh, we have a single loan of a David Smith sculpture for two years, and we're also part of a pilot program, like Peoria, who's here as well, of, um, a, that's called a collection loan uh, partner program. And that brought 14 works of American art from the Jocelyn Art Museum to the Figgy, ranging from works by Mary Cassatt to a giant uh, Kinde Wiley. And many of these works are by artists that are not represented in the Figgy's collection. And we strategically paired them with works from our own holdings to create dialogue around issues that are relevant to our community, such as issues around the, <clears throat> excuse me, the environment, as well as the realities of indigenous identity. Uh, the loans in these pairings have enabled us to broaden our audience's understanding of American art and have activated our permanent collection space in innovative ways. And these loans also came with two rounds of learning and engagement opportunities. And for our initial round, we were able to secure funding for uh, initiatives that are new to the Figgy, including a paid community advisory council and a, an art therapist-led uh, artful conversations program for families, members of the deaf and hard of hearing communities, and also healthcare workers. And I have to say that Art Bridges makes everything easy. So the application is, is simple and straightforward. It's clear. They work with you from the beginning. Uh, they meet with you multiple times to, to give you feedback and to ensure that you get the funding. As Paul says, we want to make sure that you get the funding, you get the money. And so um, as a museum director, I'm able to 
put that, I, I can feel confident putting that money in my budget for next year, or at least I hope I can if I didn't mess up today's introduction. <laughs> so, um, but when, and when you become an Art Bridges partner, um, you also become part of a community. They brought uh, all of the CLP or uh, collection loan partners down to Bentonville for a convening where we were able to talk about issues regarding the programs, um, brainstorm ideas around them, and um, also about the loans. And those conversations were helpful and they continued after that convening. Our, the educators from the cohort partners, for example, meet virtually on a regular basis to talk about programming for the loans and also talk about issues that are relevant and important for their field. So um, it's, which, and I, I honestly, I could go on and on um, about the wonderful things um, that have come out of our partnerships with Art Bridges, but I know you're here to hear from Paul and not me, so I thought I would just end with a short story. Um, we collaborate with over 200 organizations each year at the FIGI, and one of our partners uh, brought student um, refugee mothers and their children to the museum. Um, these student, mo uh, student mothers struggle financially, and most, if not all of them, have experienced emotional trauma of some form or another. And while they were at the Figgy, the women from Togo in particular were drawn to the Jocelyn's Kinde Wiley painting. They felt a connection to it, it brought tears to their eyes, and they asked to have a photo taken in front of it, as did all of the other mothers that were there. Um, they all felt a connection to this work, no matter what their nationality was. Um, and so, you know, I have to say, well, actually, as our partner said, I, I want to quote them, it and the other works brought sparks of beauty and appreciation and a much needed novel experience into the lives of these mothers and their children. And Paul, I wanna thank you for providing transformative opportunities like that at the Figgy and museums across the country. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Paul. Thank you, Michelle, and um, it's a real honor to be here with all of you today and to talk about Art Bridges. Um, special thanks uh, in particular to Tony Carmen, uh, who's the organizer of the Director's Summit. It's uh, such a brilliant idea to bring all of you together uh, in this convening style, um, and also to Jill Snyder. Um, I think it's really great in terms of uh, all the work that she's doing here at the, at the uh, 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 at Expo and the Director's su Summit. And then also thanks to Kate. Um, I don't know where Kate is probably sitting down here or in the back, oh, over there. Um, Kate Zerpitowski has been doing fantastic work too in, in organizing all of this. Um, my talk today is, um, I'm gonna explain my talk today first and how it came to be. When I got a message from Tony uh, asking if I would uh, give the, the keynote address this morning, I said, sure, that sounds really interesting. But then I was kind of stuck with what should I talk about? Um, because keynotes addre keynote addresses are supposed to be inspiring about a particular topic, and what we're trying, and, and I was thinking about how to do that, but one thing we're also trying to do at Art Bridges is just spread the word about what we're doing, because a lot of people have heard a bit about us, um, but they don't know all about us and what we're doing. So I've kind of um, split the baby, as it were, and I'm going to try to do an inspiring uh, 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 address and an inspiring keynote, and at the same time talk about our bridges and, and what we're doing. Um, I'll say that um, uh, one thing which I have come to realize, the best way to learn about Art Bridges is not from me, it's by talking to people like, um, uh, um, um, excuse me, like Michelle, sorry, uh, to talk to people like Michelle at the Figgy um, or folks uh, at uh, Peoria, other museums that are working with Art Bridges because they really have the stories uh, and, and the experience about what it means to be working with Art Bridges. Um, one thing I try to do all the time at Art Bridges is to listen to our partners. Um, we're really building Art Bridges not for us, um, not for the foundation, but um, for our partners to make Art Bridges useful um, for our, our partners and, and what they're trying to achieve with their communities. Um, what I want to talk about this morning, though, really is the whole theme of access and what, what access means. And so hopefully through the, the, the slides that we're gonna go through and some of the programs that we're gonna talk about, um, I wanna talk really about you know, what does access look like and how are we creating access with all of you? Uh, the, um, 
the, to, to begin is, this is a, fi a, a, a photo of me with my boss, Alice Walton, um, and this is a quote from Alice that everyone deserves access to art. Art is hope, it's opportunity, it's education, it's all of the things that we want. Um, and that is really uh, exactly what we're trying to do at our bridges. And when I was uh, in the interview process and meeting with Alice and others around what art bridges could be, I kept trying to tease out what it was. What is the real core essential about Art Bridges? Um, and in those early days, before I was even tapped for the job, Art Bridges which talked about sharing and sharing collections, and, and it had a lot of kind of this amorphous language, which looked interesting, but it really wasn't really the, the nut of it all. Um, and then I remember in a conversation uh, with Alice, she just kept talking about access, and I said, this is it. It's access, access, access. Um, and I explained that to her at one point, and, and I've come to realize too, is that her life and her role is really all about creating access. And uh, what she's done at Crystal Bridges is she's created extraordinary access to works of art um, in Northwest Arkansas, in a place that had no access to it. Um, and you know, and, and I also think about it this way, it's in her DNA as the daughter of Sam Walton. Um, uh, everyone may not be a fan of Walmart, but Walmart creates extraordinary access. Um, and there's a theme that, that runs through that company um, as well. So um, on that, I think about our mission. Um, Art Bridges is dedicated to expanding access to American art around the nation. And we work with museums of all sizes to support and create arts programs that educate, inspire, and deepen engagement with local audiences. Um, a little bit of nuts and bolts, and some of this is really Art Bridges 101. Um, we are business to business. So um, in, in a sense, um, our audiences are really your audiences. So when we're interested in, in expanding access and creating a, a deeper engagement with audiences, you're the ones who are actually doing the work. We help you do it, um, but in the end, the, the, those are your audiences. We're not directly engaged with audiences. Um, we are... Um, uh, we're really building our bridges for our partner museums so that they can do all of this work. Um, a couple other things too, just kind of uh, to understand our bridges. Officially, we are a private operating foundation. That's what our governance is. Uh, we are technically based in Texas. We have a post office box there, uh, but we could have offices anywhere, and we actually have offices in um, uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, where Crystal Bridges is. So we are completely separate and distinct from Crystal Bridges, the museum. Their governance, they are a public charity in the state of Arkansas. They have their own board of trustees, their own governance, their own endowment, their own staff, their own building, uh, and their own mission. And we have our own separate board of trustees, our own separate mission uh, as a an, uh, uh, endowment, collection, and all of that. So, and there's a bit of a firewall between us there where we can collaborate uh, in, and that firewall is really for tax purposes. Um, um, my, my board chair, as you can understand, leads a complicated tax life. Um, and so we can collaborate with each other between Art Bridges and Crystal Bridges, but there really is a, a, a firewall between us. Um, and so um, when, we're, uh, when we're thinking about, about that, there is some types of collaborations, I said, that, that we can do. Um, with our mission uh, is, is around expanding access to American art, um, part of our vision, and this is our, our vision here, is we're interested in being a catalyst for change um, and providing national leadership and support to enc encourage museums and cultural organizations to work differently with each other and develop innovative ways of thinking and engaging audiences for positive social impact. Um, it's not only working differently with each other, but it's also thinking differently about how they're working. Um, in, in, um, and again, this is a, a kind of bigger topics. Um, we're thinking too about what does collecting mean? We're a collecting organization, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment, um, but what is this thing about collecting that museums still continue to do? Um, and there's something, you know, what is this thing about trophy hoarding? And why, why do museums consistently do this? There's some great pictures over here, by the way. Um, and you know, uh, trophy, trophy hoarding is a personal thing. Individuals collect great works of art. Uh, it's also a civic thing. Institutions are, are civic institutions, and they collect great things. But the question we're beginning to ask, do you have to own it? Or is it okay just to have it on your wall and someone else owns it? And, what, and what's the meaning of that? Um, and, I'm, and I'll say too, like we just recently bought this great Colescott and acquired that for Art Bridges. So we're in the business of trophy buying too. Um, uh, but what we're trying to do is get those trophies on the road to, uh, to all of you, and I'll explain about, about some of that. So in the course of, of, of providing these, pro these programs and providing access, we're also trying to begin to move the needle and have conversations around what are museums really doing, how are they engaging with, 
with each other, and how can we begin to think differently about what some of those processes have been. Um, this is, um, uh, 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 we've recently, um, we're, at, we're at a point now where we've grown enough that we've gone through a, a process of really refining our mission, which we did a while ago, but also taking a look at our vision and what our values are collectively as an organization. Um, and these are important things to us. It's about access. Um, it's, you know, we're, we believe in positive social change. You know, under, under courage, it's about um, opportunities to help uh, eliminate systemic inequity in museums and cultural organizations. Um, in, ar around discovery, and this is one of my favorite ones, um, it's, it's thinking about uh, innovation, risk-taking, and transformation. Uh, and in my mind, risk-taking is something that we're in a space to do. Um, and I encourage everyone at Art Bridges um, to be, really be um, uh, thoughtful risk-takers. Um, and we've launched some programs and taken some risks, uh, which have flopped. Um, and, uh, but that's the part about being a, about being a startup, is, is undergoing those types of things. Um, another thing, too, which I, um, we have an, I have an extraordinary staff. I've been able to bring, put, put together an, an amazing team of, of some seasoned museum and, pro, and foundation professionals, as well as a bunch of early career and mid-career individuals. Um, and everyone is very charged up about issues around equity and social justice. And so I'm, I'm constantly reminding them that we're an arts foundation. We're not a social justice foundation. Um, and, uh, and we're really focused on art. But some of the outcomes that we have, given, with, uh, given the programs that we're doing, are very much uh, creating impact for positive social change. Um, here's some other things. Um, again, uh, just an overview, a vision of Alice Walton. We started officially, got off the ground in 2017, but programs really didn't get rolling until 2018. Um, we have about 225 museum partners. As I said, we're really business to business. Um, and, uh, and I uh, came on board at Art Bridges in, in 2019. So this is what our partner map looks like. We've got about 225 museums that we've been working with around the nation. And someone, a museum becomes a partner um, when we actually do something with you. We provide funding to, to, for one of our programs and are gonna show you what our programs are. There are some museums that we've been having conversations with them for four years. We just haven't done anything yet with them. Um, so they're not necessarily a partner. We wanna get them there, um, but it's a matter of finding what's the, right, what's the right project or program for a museum to jump into that we can, that they can get involved with. Um, in the end, what we're also about is, um, and I'll, you'll see this as we begin to go through some of these slides, um, I'm very much in the art distribution and art education business. Um, and what, what does that mean? It means we're in the business of moving works of art all around the country from one museum to another museum, uh, and we provide funding to get that done, and we move works of art in different ways, and I'll explain what some of those things are. Um, and then we provide loads of funding to, do, uh, to, to activate those works of art through our learning and engagement awards, which Michelle mentioned earlier. Um, and those are, um, you know, that's, that's really a key in terms of what it is. And, and so many of our programs are really collection-based programs. We're not the type of foundation that provides funding around an idea. Um, we provide funding around moving objects and then providing uh, learning and engagement uh, uh, awards and funding so that those works of art can be activated and new audiences can come in and take a look at them. Um, I'm going to focus on three programs. This is uh, a list of kind of how we work of all the programs that we have at Art Bridges that we've been launched. Um, and it would take too long to go through all of these this morning. I have something called our pitch deck, um, which is a, a, a slide deck, because I'm in sales, believe it or not. I'm, I, have to, I have to convince people that we're going to give them money and move works of art around. But I, uh, you know, we're getting the word out about Art Bridges, and that's what I do all the time, is on the phone explaining who we are and how we work and what our programs are. Um, and um, the, the, folk, the things I'm going to focus on today, I will mention as I'm going through these, but I'll just give you an, a heads up about what some of these other programs are. I'm going to talk about the Art Bridges collection and collection placements, so we are actively acquiring works of art. Uh, we're not bricks and mortar, we have offices. Um, in essence, our galleries are your galleries. Uh, we do not have galleries. Um, our galleries are your galleries all across the nation where we put our, our, our works of art. Um, traveling exhibitions, we do traveling exhibitions and we sponsor those. We provide um, uh, a funding for an organizing institution to put together an exhibition and then we provide funding for all the venues that receive the exhibition. I'm not going to go into depth about that. You can look at that on our website. What I will say, our traveling exhibitions are all collection-based exhibitions. So that's to say all of our traveling exhibitions are the objects in, the, in that exhibition are from one institution. Uh, so it's not a big loan show where you've got 40 different lenders. You just 
just have one lender, and that's easier for me because that's one contract to sign. Um, and, uh, and, and again, the way the funding works, we provide initial funding for the museum that's organizing the exhibition. Uh, we make that meaningful so that they want to play ball. Um, and then we provide funding to each one of the museums that gets the exhibition, and then we provide funding for learning and engagement on, on top of that. Um, Yacht Arpridge's Collection Loan Partnership, um, that's what Michelle mentioned as, as well, and, um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in depth. I'm also going to talk about the Cohort Program, and the Cohort Program is a, is a program which is designed for museums to collaborate closely with each other, and uh, we'll talk about that. Um, the Art Bridges Fellows Program, that is one of the few programs in a certain way that is a people-based program uh, and not a, uh, an, a collections or object-based program. And the Art Bridges Fellows Program is a three-year jobs program where we place these Early career, uh, early career individuals, museum professionals, ideally of color, um, at museums that are doing lots of work with Art Bridges. So for some of the programs that we have here, um, we ask a lot of our partners. A lot of this is heavy, heavy lifting, and so in some circumstances, we provide funding for positions uh, uh, to help with capacity. Um, you know, capacity is, is code in the museum world for we need funding for staff. And, um, and so the Art Bridges Fellow, uh, Fellows Program is a way of providing staffing within museums that are doing a lot of work for Art Bridges, but it's also a way of diversifying the museum field. So we launched the Art Bridges Fellows Program last year. Um, we have, uh, at this point, there are seven fellows out there in, in uh, mid-size and major museums around the country doing their work, and we have another cohort of fellows coming in this year. Um, and it's really amazing to see the work that, that they're doing for Art Bridges at those institutions, and it's amazing amazing to see how we're beginning to really change the face of what museum uh, staff looks like. The fellows are generally not in curatorial, because if there's one area in the museum world that there tends to be funding is curatorial. Um, and so the Art Bridges fellows ideally are working in registration, or they're working in project management, or collections management, in, in, in other areas like that. Uh, learning and engagement, we'll talk about that briefly, and that's a through line of everything we do, basically activating the, 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 uh, the objects when they get from one place to another and bringing in new audiences, thinking differently about these works of art. Um, evaluation is all about evaluation and measuring impact, so we provide funding for that as well. Um, we're very interested in collecting data and using, we're interested in both um, quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis in terms of what we're doing. So very interested in measuring impact and we provide basically um, a tool for audience surveys for our museum partners. Um, and we're doing that right now with about 45 museums around the country and it's really great because we're getting data back about impact from all these 45 different museums. The thing about what we're doing is they're all measuring the same thing and you probably understand in museum evaluation a lot of museums measure different things and you're getting apples and oranges but with the program that we're working on on, all of those 45 museums are using the same measurement instruments, so we're getting pretty consistent data, which is really great, and we're doing it over a three-year period, so we're getting a, a, a good bit of information um, over time as well. And then equity and cultural engagement, that is really uh, issues around uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, which is really a through line of everything we do. Um, and our bridges, you know, it's not as though, oh, the DEI work, that happens over there in HR, and we do our regular work. Um, I have told our staff, and they understand it these days, that the work that they are doing every day when they sit down at their desks and log onto their computers needs to be DEI work. And it turns out with a lot of the programs that you'll see we're doing, we're doing it. We're, we're really working hard at it, but we also know we have to keep, uh, keep at it and be very, very intentional about it. Um, so the Art Bridges collection and collection placements. Um, this is a fun part of what I do. It's about buying works of art. Um, I've, you know, I, I know my way around an art transaction having been in the, in, in the business for 25 years, um, but this is actually, I'll say, it's a joyful part of what we're doing. Um, all of us at Art Bridges are tremendously proud of the collection. Um, I have seen only a small fraction of the collection because it is all over the United States, um, and it's, it's with our partner institutions, and when I get to go visit places, like when I went to the Figgy and saw the Davidson it's like, oh my God, there's the David Smith, it's great. And uh, so it's, it's exciting to see, to see pictures like that when I'm, when I'm on the road and visit with our partners. Um, so we're dedicated to American art, but we, have, uh, we're, we uh, define American art very broadly and inclusively, and we think about American art as art of the American experience. Um, it, it doesn't have any political boundaries. Um, it, it's really kind of an idea about what the American experience is all about. It's really an expanding vision 
excuse me, an expanding vision of American art. We've got about 120, 130 works of art in the collection right now. Um, and it is a wide range of artists, media, and themes. Um, uh, what we're really doing in the collection is, uh, is acquiring works by traditionally underrepresented artists and, and, and communities uh, and placing those with museums that generally don't have access to those types of things. They don't have access to them because they may not have acquired them or they can't afford to acquire them because m many of them have gotten relatively expensive. Um, so that's a way of, 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 of helping our partners with that. Um, I also think about the Art Bridges collection as a working collection. Um, and so it's a collection that we are building and putting together for our partners, because it gets on the road for our partners. Um, it's a working collection, and I also think about uh, that we deploy works of art to achieve certain outcomes. So I, I think very practically about what these works of art are doing for us. Um, something like this Lee Krasner, um, I love it. It's a beautiful picture. It's really glamorous. Um, it's on my screensaver. Um, and um, you know, it's one of those things that, um, that is, is great. When this picture was on view at the MFA St. Pete uh, a number of years ago, I got a message from the, from, from the director at the time saying, this is an extraordinary thing. We never dreamed we'd have a picture of this quality in our galleries. Um, and so for us to be able to, to, to send kick-ass pictures like this around the nation and then do loads of, uh, of learning and engagement around them is, is really one of the joyful things that we can do. Uh, other works that are in the Art Bridges collection, um, this is a wonderful Carrie James Marshall, wonderful Judy Chicago, a T.C. Cannon. Uh, the Art Bridges collection has a particular breadth and depth in works by black artists. Um, we have great works um, uh, like the work on the right, uh, not great 19th century painting, a masterwork by Henry Asawa Tanner. But we also have, um, going back here, we also have uh, works uh, by 20th century African American artists as well as more contemporary work. Uh, the Judy Chicago, again, we, we've been focusing on buying women artists, uh, uh, traditionally underrepresented in most collections, and then T.C. Cannon, um, a, a wonderful indigenous painter. Uh, and then we also have more traditional things like uh, the Morrison Hartley. We've got some other Stieglitz Circle things. We've got a couple of beautiful works by Georgia O'Keeffe. We have a Diego Rivera, and that's about art of the American experience. Um, and um, uh, you know, Diego, pe most people think about him as a Mexican painter, but he spent a lot of time in San Francisco. He spent time in California and in Detroit uh, and in New York for that matter. So he is very much part of the American experience. Um, and the Tanner, um, when that um, came across my desk, it's like, wow, that's a, just, just an amazing picture. Um, and, uh, and the way the collection, uh, 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 run into some recent acquisitions, the way this works is that our, our partner institutions generally give us a call or they email, uh, email us. All of the collection is available online um, and they'll get in touch with our curator and say, I'd like to borrow this, this, and this, and this. Um, and what's really great is particular institutions now are beginning to curate out of our collection, which is exactly what we want to have happen. Um, our friends here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum did that exactly. They said, could we borrow these things here? And we said, sure. Uh, and I was thrilled when I got that email because I knew exactly what they were up to. And, um, and the, the idea of curating things from our collection to, to achieve a particular outcome. They were interested, and I have photos and we can share them here, they were interested in acquiring works by African American artists so that they could do outreach to an African American community in Peoria, which is significant. Um, and as a general matter, they don't have those collections to support that type of engagement. Um, and then when we provided funding for learning and engagement as well, um, it becomes even more meaningful in terms of getting those audiences in the, in the door. Um, so I would encourage you, and, and I'll say too, that Art Bridges is not just big museum and small museum or, found, or, or foundation and small museum. We have, um, we have major museums borrowing things from our collection as a way of activating their own collection. Um, uh, the Met is going to be borrowing um, uh, Thankful Poor. Um, and so even institutions like that have holes in their collection which they can fill with things from us or from other places as well. Um, great Elizabeth Catlett, which, is, uh, which we've acquired, um, and a wonderful Alice Trumbull Mason. Um, we also have some works on paper. Uh, these great Cindy Shermans and a great David Hammonds, obviously not a work on paper. Um, because the works of art, for example, on the collection loan placements, when we send those from our bridges, we like to have them on long-term loan. So ideally they're there for six months or usually 12, 18, or 24 months. Um, and the idea there is that, that you as a museum can use them um, and can good, do good programming and really create access to, to communities that wouldn't necessarily see those types of things. Um, here are some images of um, uh, breaking down barriers. This is um, up top. Um, this is a fun shot. American art can be fun too. That's our Alex Katz. 
um, with everyone with dark sunglasses, uh, with everyone at Peoria with their hand on their chin. Um, this is a great picture here, again at Peoria, of our Terry Adkins um, and our Mark Bradford, um, and some images of the families that, are, that came in to see that show. Um, and then down below um, our Jimenez, which is also on view at, at Peoria as part of collection placements. Um, and so those are images of, in, in terms of how we're deploying our artworks in our collection to achieve certain outcomes. Um, the Collection Loan Partnership um, is a similar type of program. We're moving works of art around. In this situation, what, what it is, we're, is we're taking works um, from museums that have broad, deep collections, mostly in storage, and putting those collections on the road to museums that don't have access to those types of things. Um, and. Um, uh, this is what it is. It's a new lending model that allows museums to circulate their collections that would otherwise sit in storage. And it aims to increase works of, arts by, uh, works of art by BIPOC and other and women artists, um, LGBTQIA+, uh, and women artists uh, to fill gaps in museum collections. And then we also provide significant learning and engagement. Um, and um, Michelle was, was mentioning this, this, uh, this program a moment ago. Um, we have my colleague Sarah Martin here from, from Art Bridges. Um, and Sarah is in charge of the Collection Loan Partnership. So, so she is the one who is orchestrating all of this movement of art. Um, the way it's working right now, we have um, four or five lenders to the program. So LACMA has kicked in about 80 works of Latinx material. The Jocelyn, many of you know the Jocelyn has been closed for renovations. So when a museum closes for renovations or expansions, Art Bridges has learned that that's a great time for us to swoop in and take their collection. Um, and so we took, we took about 50 of their great works of American art, not from storage, but from their main galleries. Um, and uh, 19th century things, 20th century things, and 21st century things. Uh, the Folk Art Museum is sending stuff to the program, and then Crystal Bridges sent stuff to the program as well, and Art Bridges did. We sent some of our own material to the programs. The way it works is that these works are grouped into groups of about 10 to 15 objects, um, and each museum that received the works, and, this is the, whoop, and here's the group of museums that received the work, each one of these museums would get a group of 10 to 15 objects from one of those museums. Um, we allow them to either install the works as almost like a focus exhibition, or they can, they can spread the works of art throughout their galleries. Um, and what Michelle did is was really great. She took the, the Kahindi Wiley from the Jocelyn and put it in their European paintings gallery, all these great portraits. And it looks just fantastic. So the idea of these, you know, these interruptions and, and, and uh, uh, of, of doing it, it, it's a real surprise, but it was really great to see that. Um, uh, and and as, again, as Michelle said, then we also provide funding for learning engagement once those works of art um, are in those, uh, in those institutions. The idea here, too, is this, is this is going to be a program that isn't static, but it continues to grow. So right now, we've got these different museums. I think, for example, the Mattituck Museum in Waterbury, Connecticut, um, they have works of art from the Jocelyn. Um, and after that, they are going to switch, after the works from the Jocelyn go back to the Jocelyn, they're going to get a group of works from LACMA. So the idea of these things will continue to turn and turn and turn. And um, I'm getting, uh, is, that a t is that a timing question? Yeah, exactly, we'll get there. Um, and so that's, um, that's one of the, um, uh, one of the aspects of the program is that we will be getting more lenders in and we'll be getting more borrowers into the program as well. Um, here's some photographs um, above. We've got LACMA works um, at the Plains Museum and Jocelyn works at the MFA St. Pete in Florida. Um, the collection loan, uh, so what I want to talk about now is the cohort program. Um, and the cohort program is designed for museums to work closely with each other. Um, and so we have a number of cohorts, uh, and the way it works is a cohort has a lead, um, and the lead museum uh, uh, decides to work with and invites a group of smaller, not always smaller, but regional museums, sometimes smaller, to do collaborative work with them. Um, and right now, um, what these programs also do is they support professional development through convenings and workshops. Um, they work in phases, so the first phase is generally a collection sharing among all of them, which might be lending one or a few pictures which circulate among the cohort. The second phase might be something which is a lot more engaged. Um, and so you can see here that Detroit is working with these museums in the state of Michigan. The Wadsworth is working with three museums in the Deep South. LACMA is working with museums in LA County. MFA Boston is working with museums in New England and the Northeast. The SAM is working 
with uh, four museums in the far west, and you can see the rest there. We have um, cohorts in development. Um, the, the high is going to be developing a, a cohort. Uh, Cincinnati is going to be developing a cohort too. They'll be working with museums. They haven't determined exactly which ones, but most likely museums in the Ohio Valley and Appalachia. Um, and so we're beginning to build more and more. The Chrysler actually is probably going to be working with HBCUs in the Tidewater region, which is, uh, which is really inspiring in terms of that. The Memphis Brooks will probably be building a cohort of peers. Uh, and um, they do uh, collaborative work together in terms of creating different exhibitions which travel among uh, the, uh, uh, within, the, within the cohort. And so here are two examples of some of those exhibitions. The, the cohorts to date, we've pr produced 84 different exhibitions uh, and uh, within, within the cohort program. And here we have uh, two exhibitions, one which was done by the SAM cohort in the far west, which, which includes four museums plus SAM. So it's called, the exhibition is called Many Wests. And what this basically is, is a, um, an investigation of myths of the American West. Um, and it was curated by curators from all five institutions. The exhibition has objects from all five institutions, and the show is going to all five institutions. Um, and so we provided funding to get all of that done, and that at each venue there's been funding for learning and engagement as well. Um, and so that has been a real success. This was an amazing show. Uh, the Mattertuck Museum borrowed some things from the MFA Boston. They're part of the MFA Boston cohort, and they put together an extraordinary show um, of black artists called A Face Mike Like Mine. There's a significant African-American population in Waterbury, Connecticut. The Mattertuck has been very good about doing outreach to that community to begin with, but this was a way of deepening that relationship. Um, and this was shown, unfortunately, only at the Mattertuck Museum, and the, the senior staff from the MFA Boston went out to Waterbury, Connecticut to see the show, and they said, oh my god, we should have taken the show. Um, and it was really just the sheer quality of the show, which Mattertuck put together, was amazing. It also had one of my favorite pictures in it, which I hadn't seen before, is that first image by Barclay Hendricks of Brenda P. And I walked in and saw it in the gallery. It's like, oh my god, there's Brenda P. It's a great picture. Um, and so learning engagement. This is what we talked about and Michelle talked about as well, is a through line of everything we do. And we like our learning and engagement projects to be multidisciplinary, to be community building, and be transformative. Um, and it's one thing to move a work of art from one place to another, but then you really need to activate it uh, and, and put more meaning around it and interpret it. And that's what uh, learning and engagement is uh, as a through line of everything we do. Um, talking about access and engagement, um, what that, in my mind, is really all about engaging new audiences, uh, and that's, that's really at the core of what we're trying to do, uh, is help our audience, help our partners get that done, um, and really focusing on traditionally underrepresented audiences um, and bringing those people into, into the museum. Um, and I'll add, too, that I think walking through this, something I mentioned earlier, is you know, values around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access are baked into what we do. Um, that's about, those are values that are tremendously important to, to my board chair and to me and to our staff. And so that's how we're really thinking about growing and building our bridges. Um, and so with that, I will say thank you very much uh, and um, would be happy to take any questions that you might have. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Well, I'm a researcher and you mentioned data, so I have a data question. Yeah. Um, really pleased to hear you say that you have a standard measure, because having kind of a large standard data set really actually helps all of us in ways that I think a lot of people don't realize. When it comes to qualitative data, we know quantitative can be really compelling to a lot of people. It makes a great chart, makes great math. Yeah. but. So many of the outcomes you're talking about sound deeply qualitative and personal, and I'm curious if you could just talk a little more about how you work with and value qualitative data, particularly around lasting transformation. Yeah, so um, uh, one thing that we're, we're uh, in terms of lasting transformation, uh, we're, you know, we're, we are interested in creating a baseline for where a museum is and then, uh, and then having further conversations with them about what that change looks like so that we can really try to measure the change. You know, our challenge is, particularly around evaluation, 
is that during a pandemic, most museums are closed and it's hard to do audience evaluation. Um, so we've kind of, we've, and I've been on the job for three and a half years, so we've been a little bit behind on that. So um, the project, uh, the instrument that we use is something called Coves, which was a, a product, um, no, I wouldn't call it a, a, a product, but it's a, a system that was developed by the Museum of Science in Boston uh, to do audience surveys, mostly with science museums, and then they built one out for art museums. Um, and what we do basically there is we, um, we provide funding to our partner museums uh, with uh, between five and ten thousand dollars, depends on what the size of the operating budget is for the institution. We provide a, t a tablet or several tablets, uh, as well as funding for training for staff or docents uh, to greet uh, visitors in a museum after they've come out of, come out of an exhibition or something like that, and say, "Would you create or would you take this audience survey? We'd love to hear your thoughts about what this about what the exhibition was." And so we ask them in that a whole bunch of different questions. Um, some of them, and then we compile all that data and what's really great is we've got 45 museums around the country using that same data set or using that same tablet and those same questions around different types of exhibitions and all of that so within that we're, we are getting uh, you know as we've started we will have three relationships with all of those museums that are doing that so we're getting a baseline about demographics and some of those things now and we'll begin to see more information as it comes down the pike um, and so that also uh, includes uh, that instrument includes, obviously, uh, for us to, to, to get some quantitative analysis from it, but it also has room for quantitative or qualitative as well. So we're kind of, we're, we're operating on, on both fronts in, in that space. Yep. Yes. Um, and that is, I'm wondering if your data is being shared or if you have any collaborative efforts with groups like SMU Data Arts or the NEA or Americans for the Arts that you know are what? also collecting data. Um, uh <laughs> this may sound like a cop-out answer, but we're such a new foundation, we haven't begun doing that yet. Um, I sure, I, I'm, I'm certain we will. You know, the, we're, what we are also, we're, we're sharing the data that we're collecting with each partner institution. So the data we collect from that institution, we're sharing that with them. We're also sharing with all the institutions the cumulative data we're getting across the board. Um, and um, uh, so we're just in the process of doing that. Uh, uh, the other thing too, I'll say as a matter, general matter, data and collecting data is very important to us. Uh, I, when I came on board, or even before I came on board, uh, I had a conversation with Alice Walton, my boss, and, and I said, Alice, if we want to scale up our bridges the way you're talking about it, we're really going to need to build a robust IT infrastructure to get that done. Um, and so again, you know, these are all programmatic stuff, but most of my day is about building a new business and building a foundation and building systems and creating systems so that we can be efficient with workflows and work streams and all of that. Um, and you know, and, and the, the, those efficiencies about how we're working together have been tremendously important and we've got great systems in place which we've been able to build. Um, all of those systems are beginning to create, to, to, we're beginning to get data from those systems. In particular, when all of our partner museums apply, um, they will be, we have a new portal which they'll be applying through and I hope our, it's great to hear our applications are easy and simple and I hope they continue that way. Um, that's one of my goals is they need to be easy and simple but we ask our partners a lot of questions in the course of that application and when they finish up the project they have to send a final report so one of the questions will be initially on the application how many visitors do you anticipate will be coming to this exhibition and we have that number and then when they finish up and do the final report we'll get the final report and we'll ask how many visitors actually attended so we're getting information uh, and a lot of data from our partners around through those different reports that are coming through our systems um, and one person I'm going to be hiring is a data engineer Engineer, someone on staff who can take a look at all the data that we get are getting from all the different systems and and, let, and you know we're collecting enough data now uh, around these partner museums around the nation to have a better idea of what that's going to look like and have someone who's a specialist in that area really drill down and tell the story of what's happening with our audiences um, uh, and our partner audiences around the country yes question way in the back With, with the pieces you're purchasing, you say you have 120 works. Do you, like, how are you deciding what works to purchase? Are they housed at certain institutions or at your site? Um, how does that 
work with those Yeah, pieces. so, um, you know, like, uh, we're, uh, one thing I didn't say, but I would say, you know, officially we're a private operating foundation, but from an operational perspective, we are part museum and part foundation. So we have, fun we have functions that are very museum-like. We collect, we do traveling exhibitions, so we have curators and registrars and traditional museum functions, but by the same token, we give money away. So we have program officers, um, uh, on, which are traditional foundation roles as well. Um, and so, like other institutions that are collecting institutions, we have a collecting strategy. Uh, we work, uh, you know, our, our, our strategy in many ways is, is to, to create or to, to acquire works of art um, that our partners can use and need and, and, and can use um, to change the dialogue and to, and to switch things up with the types of things that they're doing. Uh, and so we, so it's it's the curatorial team that is really making decisions around uh, around what we want to be collecting and what the collection looks like. So uh, with respect to where the works are, um, they are all over the place, and that's the whole idea: is that they are um, they are in um, in museum galleries all around the country. When they are not on, uh, if something needs to rest or it needs conservation work or stuff like that, we have a storage facility in Texas. Um, and that's where the things live there. But um, I am constantly being asked by my boss, like, is everything on the road? Um, because she wants things on the road. She doesn't want things in storage, period, full stop. Um, and the idea is to get these things out and on the road so other communities can, can see them. We're building new offices, um, and, um, uh, which, are, which will not have any space for art. It is completely antithetical for Art Bridges to have a decent work of art in our offices. Those works of art be belong on the road. Um, and with our partner museums. And that's, that's really what our ethos is in terms of how the collection works and how we're deploying those works of art. Yes, back over there. I was thinking about the fact that the, um, the cohort leaders are all w well established museums with lots of infrastructure to uh, protect the works of art that they have. And so as they go out to some of the smaller museums, there may be gaps in their capabilities. So would, would your organization provide both the, the investment and the operating support that might be necessary in order to properly uh, preserve and display these priceless works of art that may be beyond the, yeah. qu the quality of other objects in their collection? So as a general matter, um, we don't provide general operating support. And we're not in the business of, of providing, um, you know, re replacing HVAC, HVAC systems at museums around the country. Um, and that's, um, uh, that's a choice of my board chair and what her and our vision is for what the foundation can do. Um, there are an awful lot of things that we, there are a load of things that we don't do. Um, and, uh, you know, that's crossed our mind, but as a general matter, that's not something that, that the type of thing that we fund. Uh, you know, with respect to the cohorts, um, uh, the initial, the, that, the cohort program was, had been launched when I came on board in 2019, um, and the model has been these large museums in major metropolitan areas working with a group of smaller museums. Um, as we've been building new cohorts, I have been sh uh, shaping that differently. So for example, um, the Memphis Brooks Museum in Memphis is going to be building a cohort, but that's really going to be a cohort of peers. Um, so we're thinking differently about what that what those cohorts look like. Um, the Portland, Oregon cohort is going to be working with um, some indigenous art centers uh, and some museums in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and again, we're trying to, you know, the, the original cohorts, it, everything was a museum, and we're beginning to think differently about building a cohort which can be a little bit more, or a little looser uh, in defining what these organizations are like and what they're doing. Because the way um, Brian Fariso described to me uh, what they wanted to do and what, they're, what they were hoping to achieve by doing a, building a cohort and building this collaborative relationship. He was thinking very much with working with these, uh, with the indigenous communities in the Pacific Northwest. And if you want to do it in a museum, they're probably not going to be interested in doing that. So we're, we're kind of, the, the cohort is being built very differently in, 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 in that example. Uh, another question? Yes. You know, it would be to um, a, a very simple, um, uh, <laughs> at our bridges we call it a gateway drug, is to borrow something from the Art Bridges collection. 
So, um, and uh, the collection's on, um, on view. Uh, in the, on our website, and you can go and take a look at things. Uh, you can email our curator, Ashley Holland. Uh, her email address is on the website. Um, and, uh, and that starts a conversation saying we'd, we'd be interested in borrowing these things. Uh, with our collection and with a lot of these collections, we always take a look at facilities reports. Uh, and, um, and so, for example, uh, you know, a question before about the cohort, about lending things, that the, the, we're, we're always looking at facilities reports to make certain that the facilities um, can provide the type of care which a lot of these collections have. So for something like the Collection Loan Partnership, which involves LACMA, Crystal Bridges, uh, uh, and, uh, and the Jocelyn, they are all approving facilities reports, and they're comfortable with, those work, with their works of art going to those institutions. Um, sometimes there are institutions where we take a look at the facilities reports and they just aren't up to snuff for some of our major works, but we have some works that we can send there anyway. Um, so we have a, a wonderful work, uh, one, again, one of my favorite. It's a F um, Felix Gonzalez Torres. It's a candy spill. Um, the whole point of the work is that people take pieces away from it and, it and it doesn't need special temperature control or humidity or anything else like that. So there are works of art that we have in the collection that really can go anywhere. Actually, the Felix Gonzalez Torres um, it's installed right now at a, um, we can install it at multiple venues, which is another great thing about that piece, but it's installed at a, uh, a library in Colorado. Um, and they contacted us and they had a great program about how they wanted to use that piece in a public library. So we're interested in providing that type of access even in that space as well. So again, have them reach out. Um, a lot of the works in the Art Bridges collection, you know, we've got this big spreadsheet uh, about where the works are and how long they're on view, um, but we would be delighted to, to, to have conversations around that. Um, with all of these, there's something like the Collection Loan Partnership, um, or with the, the, you know, we would provide funding to get the work of art to your museum, and then what's there, we will provide funding for um, all those learning and engagement to activate the works of art. Same thing with the Collection Loan Partnership. We provided a significant stipend to LACMA and to Jocelyn to send the things to the program. Um, and then we provided all the funding to do the packing, crating, insurance, and shipping of those works from the Jocelyn to the Figgy or to Peoria. Uh, and we can provide some funding for installation if that's necessary, and we'll pay to get the works back to the Jocelyn. Um, but while they're there, we do learning and engagement. So basically, most m not, uh, not everything we do is fully, fully funded. In some circumstances, we ask our partners to go out and do a little bit of fundraising. Um, we call that, we want to have our partners have some skin in the game as well. Um, and so, uh, but as a general matter, like our traveling exhibitions, um, we provide around for the venues, we provide around 70-80% um, of the funding for, for the traveling exhibitions. Uh, and then also to, for the institutions organizing the traveling exhibition, we provide a stipend to them which is meaningful so that they'll, they'll play ball. Um, one more question? Sure, let's do one more. One more. Right down here. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, what are some of the, the stumbling blocks or hurdles that you face in, in their minds, in the museum minds? Because it seems so obvious. They have thousands of work in yeah. storage that they'd love to get out there. What, what are, why are they reticent if they are? So um, uh, as a general matter, you know, because we're a startup and a new foundation, uh, we play ball with people who want to play ball with us. Um, and um, so it's generally, I have been focused on lo low-hanging fruit. Um, and, f and some institutions, it's very interesting, um, they just don't seem to be tremendously interested. Um, and, and that's about organizational culture. They have different, as an organization, they are thinking about different types of things. And they want to take their institution in different, uh, in, to different places. And I respect that. Um, we'll get them sometime. Um, they're institutions which get us in a heartbeat. LACMA has been amazing. Um, what they're trying to do in, in LA County in terms of sharing their collection across LA County is what we're trying to do on a national scale. And so, we're, you know, so, um, uh, so our vision about sharing works of art nationally is something that Michael Govan and, and LACMA is interested in doing as well. So at this point, um, we're, uh, we're, we're engaged with them in a substantive way. You know, um, the, the question, you know, and again with my business background, is what's our, what's, our, um, what's our value proposition? What's our value proposition with these different museums? And when we talk to a, a smaller regional museum, the question I ask them is what do you want and what do you need? And they can answer it in a heartbeat. Um, and Michelle describes some of those things. It's, you know, it, it's an easy lift for us to provide 
um, those types of, 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 of services and support so that they can do the types of things which they haven't been able to do. I ask a different question to some of the bigger major museums um, because it's not what you want, what you need. They'll say we need general operating support and that's not something we generally provide. Um, my question to them is how do you want to contribute? And, you know, and that's a very different question. And as an institution, um, you know, uh, LACMA can tell you in a heartbeat how they want to contribute. Other, other institutions are still trying to wrap their head around how they can contribute. What's great about um, the collection loan partnership that I talked about, uh, the Folk Art Museum has, uh, has sent great stuff. We're having great conversations with Cleveland that will be sending stuff to the program. We're having conversations with MoMA that will be sending to the program. We're having conversations to the, with the Whitney that will be coming to the program. Um, I've learned too, um, my ask needs to be reasonable. So I can't go to MoMA and say, we need 100 works of art. <laughs> and, you know, and, and they're going, what? Um, so what I'm doing now is, you know, I've learned, nope, I can't, you know, Mo, uh, uh, LACMA sent us 80 works, um, but LACMA, those were in storage and they said, take these, and we said, that's great. Uh, whereas working with, with some of these other museums, my ask is, can, can, we, can, can you share a dozen works? Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a lower, it's a it's a lower threshold. Um, and I'm also trying to, um, the other thing too is, is that we're providing what I'm trying to make is a generous stipend. So it in, incentivizes them to, to, to play as well and to, to send things to the program. Um, I've also tried to explain to them that, uh, and all, most all museums want to think this way, but the larger institutions want to think this way as well, is how can we get embedded in their long-range their long range plan and long-range budgeting as well? So that if they can count on ArtBridge's funding for the next five years, that's very helpful for them. And with some of these cohorts, the awards that we're giving are millions of dollars, and, and they, they've, they've appreciated that. So those, you know, the cohorts last three or five years and can be re renewed. So I'm trying to put in place uh, the types of programs uh, which fit in easily to those institutions. And so I'm, you know, in big institutions function a little bit differently than, than some of our smaller regional partners. So trying to find the right, um, the right program and the right way of working with some of these institutions at times can be a challenge, but we're getting there because we've been working with some of them. Well, on behalf of Expo Chicago, thank you so much for joining us here at the University Club. Thank you to Paul Provost. Thank you so much. <laughs>